my circumstance become my comfort though. I will not let the fears of life and sorrows of this world dictate to me how I should feel. When you are my true love. Oh, 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 you are my true It's the shorts. That's what's doing it to you. Well, we are glad you're here. If some of you have noticed, one of our air conditioners isn't working. So, uh, yes, uh, there's a few that are very happy about that. The rest of you all, uh, I, I never encourage anybody to move back. Always encourage to move forward. But if you want, while we're singing and stuff like that, it's probably a little cooler the farther back you get. Now, the downside is if you sit in front of Zoomy, Zoomy's going to, you know, you know, whack your head or something like that. So, but anyway, we want <laughs> Man wears a pair of shorts and all of a sudden he's, he's rim shot Ronnie over there. I, got, I had to get you back. Okay. Well, we are excited to worship and praise today. We know, like I say, there's a lot of people traveling and, and I, I thought ahead. I brought this. Otherwise, I'm going to be in bad shape. Uh, but we've got uh, some folks that are traveling. We want to keep them in our prayers. And uh, so, but we'll be excited to have them back. But it's great to, to have all of you here with us to worship together. So let's open with a word of prayer. God, I thank you for this blessing that you've given us and this time to come together as a family to praise your name and honor you through what we say and do. Lord, we pray that that will be the outcome. That as you hear us, that you are honored and glorified by the things that we say and do. But more than that, Lord, that you'll be honored and glorified by the thoughts of our heart and our mind, that we would focus our attention, if not for just a short time, here on you and you alone. We just thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Yours will be the only name that matters to me. Favor I see the only name that matters to me. Yours will be friendship and affection I need to feel the Father smiling on me. The only name that matters to me. Yours is a name.
sing that name. Here we go. Jesus 
today we're talking about this idea of, of uh, God providing for our needs. And uh, later in the worship service, we have an offering today. And of course, it's our fifth Sunday, a fifth Sunday of the month. And so we'll be taking up an offering that we've been collecting all this week as well online. And we'll be giving it to uh, the Dream Center here in, in Winter Garden. But one of the things that we sometimes struggle with is we get so attached to the things of this world. And at the end of the day, we can say things like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. And we realize that when it comes to eternity, that's really all we need. Yet we still hold on to a lot of things. In our message today, we'll be coming from James chapter 5. And James addresses this problem. And I'm so grateful that we can see many other scriptures that we'll talk about today that, talk, that share with us the idea of accumulation of wealth, using things over people is, is the, the better way to go. We don't need to use people. We don't need to use circumstances to try to accumulate more and more. And, and God gives us that example in the way he loves us. I've got a friend Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend And he is my strength And he is my portion With me in the valley With me in the fire with me in the storm. We are not alone. 
Savior He is. What a Father, what a friend, what a Savior He is. Father, thank you for all those things. For you're our Father, but through Jesus Christ you've become our friend. You've lived out what Christ taught. The greater love hath no man than this. A man would lay down his life for a friend. You are our Savior. You're our hope. So we praise you and we honor you in this place today. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may notice that there is not a, uh, a break today. A lot of that was based upon the fact that it's really hot in here today, so I'm trying to keep things moving for us today. Not in any hurry, but uh, I did want to share with you a message today from the, uh, the book of James. And if you uh, need a, uh, a journal, we do have some journals back there. I know we're in the fifth chapter, so we're almost done, but those journals are a gift for you. So if... Uh, Anybody needs one? If you'd raise a hand, I'll make sure we get you one. All right, need at least one there. All right. And you won't offend me if during this time you feel like this thing's not moving along as much as I'd like. I better go ahead and get a snack. Uh, you won't offend me. But. I want to begin today sharing a parable of Jesus. It says that in uh, Luke chapter 12, this story says... Uh, a rich man's farm produced a big crop. And he said to himself, what can I do? I don't have a place large enough to store everything. Later, he said, now I know what I'll do. An idea comes to him. He says, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones where I can store all my grain and other goods. Then I'll say to myself, you have stored up enough good things to last for years to come. Live it up. Eat, drink, enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, tonight you will die. Then who will get what you have stored up? And Jesus concludes the parable by saying, this is what happens to people who store up everything for themselves, but are poor in the sight of God. I, I, uh, I recognize that I'm getting older. Because of this next statement, I realized that about 35 years ago, this was the text of my sermon at Florida Christian College when I was called upon to do my senior sermon at the school. All the uh, senior guys at the school, when they got to that time, they prepared and preached in the chapel service. And this was the text that I used. Now, I can tell you that it may have fallen on deaf ears because most of the other college students I went with would never have been considered rich men or women. But I remember these were my main points for the message. And they're appropriate for us today to, to focus on for a moment. In this parable that Jesus tells, this man is focusing on himself. And when he did so, he forgot about the needs of others. He was so focused on what he had accomplished or what he had accumulated that he forgot to think about the needs that others might have had around him. I understand it's a parable, so we don't have all the details of the story. But we don't see at any time him going, wonder if there's something good I could do with this excess that I have. Second point was, in focusing on his blessings, he forgot the one who had blessed him. We also see nowhere in this parable him stopping and saying, Lord, you, you've been so gracious to me. You know, I've got so much excess, so much more than I expected to have. And it's clear he did. He had worked, probably worked hard for it, but he was in a position where he had so, many, so much good, so much grain, so much feed that he couldn't store it in the barns that he had. And his great idea was, let me tear these down and build a bigger one. And here was the third point. In focusing on his plans for that day, he forgot to prepare for eternity. Obviously, that's the greatest mistake he made. Thinking that he could tear down his barns, build bigger ones, and then just sit back and enjoy life. And God said, nope, tonight it is your appointed time. Who's going to get all that stuff that you have? 
Now, James, as he writes his letter, as we begin the fifth chapter of that, he echoes those sentiments in a way. He says at the first verse of James 1, he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. You know, in light of the materialism and favoritism James has expressed and addressed throughout this letter, he now provides this solid, emphatic reminder of the temporary nature of human wealth. And to remind them of this, to, to drive this point home, he takes on sort of a role of a prophet here and speaks in terms reminiscent of the Old Testament prophets when they were calling out the sins of the people of Israel. He's calling out those who are rich in this life. Now, his pronouncements are no longer obviously addressed just to the Christian community alone. As we know, James was writing this letter, but through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that letter also speaks to us. Now, it is not my desire today, because this is a rabbit hole we don't want to go down, to describe what is rich and what is not in this light. Because it might be very easy for us to say, well, I'm not rich by this community standards, or I may not be rich by this state or this country's uh, standards, but by the world standards, maybe I am. No, instead, I want to focus instead on the attitude that he's talking about here. This letter is intended to be read in the Christian community, but it was not just simply for those Christians. His words are designed to awaken his readers by means of a firm list of warnings about the miseries associated with wealth and the accumulation of wealth above all else, of, of that being the pursuit of your life. And today our message is entired, entitled, Coming Misery, because that's what James is saying. Misery is coming for those of you who focus your whole life on the accumulation of wealth and material things. You know, we see warning signs everywhere. You probably saw some on the way this morning. Signs that tell us of this coming misery or pending danger that may be ahead of us. Maybe it's a sign on the road that says, you know, hey, you'd better merge, because if you don't merge, you're going to crash into the side of this uh, work truck. Uh, maybe it's a sign that says, uh, it's warn a warning sign that says, if you eat or drink this product that's in front of you, it's, it's poisonous. Those are the things I try to give to our dogs. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. I, I, don't. I hope my wife's not watching right at this moment. I'm going to get in trouble. No, but we know when it says poison, if it's got that skull and crossbones on the front of it, we go, oh, we probably shouldn't eat this, should we? Some signs tell us that the floor around us is slippery and that if we try to run too fast, we might fall. Each of these signs, these harbingers of danger, carry a similar theme. Misery is coming if you choose to ignore these warning signs. And we find ourselves viewing such warning signs from James as we begin this fifth chapter of his letter and continue this sermon series on authentic faith. In this decidedly prophetic manner, James warns his re readers about this misery that is coming to those who focus only on the accumulation of wealth, especially at the expense of other people and at the expense of godly pursuits. So, I want to share with you these three warnings today that I think we find in, in these first six verses. First warning is this, if you want to jot this in your journal. Warning, don't define your life by possessions. Don't try to define your life by possessions. James addresses this in the second and third verses of chapter 5. He says, your riches have rotted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. And their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Wow. Very poignant language. Why does he share that? Why is it wrong to define your life by possessions? Well, mostly because they don't last. That which is new, we recognize, does not stay new, does it? How long does that new car smell last? All right. How long does that toy that the kid get, uh, uh, got at Christmas last? <laughs> Right, David, two hours later, what are they doing? They're playing in the box it came in, right? <laughs> Things that are new don't stay new. They lose that tarnish, or they, they tarnish and they lose that beautiful look to them. They start to get dirty, they start to get beat up and scratched, and all of a sudden they're not new anymore. 
It's the nature of things. That which is valuable doesn't always retain value, does it? Investments in the stock market? Last couple years, if you did that, you're recognizing the, the, the loss of value. But you know what? Those things and all these other ideas that we can talk about, it doesn't stop us from that disease that takes a hold of us sometimes. That disease of always wanting more. Always wanting better. Always wanting the next thing. Always wanting to upgrade our lives. Here's what James says. Your prized possessions ultimately are going to become rotted riches. They're going to fall apart in your hands. Your finest fashionables ultimately became, will become out-of-date duds. You won't be in style anymore. You'll have to wait for bell bottoms to come back in. Your treasured troves ultimately will become wasted wealth because somebody else is going to get it or someone else is going to take advantage of it. The seeds of death and decay are found in all of creation and it's a great mistake to think that there is real security in any of these things. Jesus understood that. In that same 12th chapter that we read a story from before, he continued with that idea in verse 33 of Luke. He said, sell your possessions and to give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven will never get old and will not develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. As you know, I have a couple kids and, and it's interesting to watch them learn the value of things. Um, uh, both of the kids, at one time or another, have gotten wallets that have been lost for long periods of time. I don't know where they're at. Uh, Robbie found his once uh, that he had lost uh, like two years before and had gift cards in it. And it was like finding a treasure, you know. Uh, Malia currently is missing a wallet. So if any of you all have Malia's wallet, please give it back to her. But what they, both of them, you know, they, they recognize that when Robbie found that, that wallet that he hadn't had for so long, it was, like, it was like a trip down memory lane. And all of a sudden, he had these, these gift cards that he had never used before. Like I say, it was like storing up a treasure somewhere. Now, in his version, he was storing up a treasure by losing it. But that's neither here nor there. The point was, we can do that in heaven. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures that are in heaven. Do things that are going to last in heaven because the, the, the purses up in heaven, they don't develop holes. Nothing falls out. They don't get old. They stay brand new. I know it sounds great in principle to say that, but it's still hard when we're here on this earth. But we need to remember this truth. The physical deterioration of treasure, your treasures, will often mirror the inward decay of your moral and spiritual life. You hang on too tightly to those things that don't last, and then ultimately they will also corrode the inside of your life. That's what James told these guys. It's going to burn you up. Jesus went on to say in verse 34, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Not hard to look far. Where your treasure is, there is the desires of your heart. I asked, I asked my son this week, I said, what are the five most important things to you? And it threw him off because he wasn't ready for that. So I had to think a long time about it. You know, and of course, being the good dad that I am, I made, you know, I kind of twisted everything he said. Well, I really like this. And I said, oh, so you don't love your mom and I, you know, uh, yeah, got to got to keep him on his toes. But I told him, I said, that's something we need to do at all times, to, to regularly inventory that question, what are the five most important things in my life? Because if we don't, the desires of our hearts start going in directions they never should. You see, God meant for wealth to be used for good, for the good of mankind. But James says it will destroy the rich. It shall eat your flesh as though it were fire. That's going to be the, the outcome if your, your focus is on accumulating wealth. By itself, we know this. We've, you've probably heard this in a sermon before. Money is not evil. Money is not sinful. It's a neutral thing. It's a thing. It's a, it's a tool that people can use for commerce. It's simply a thing. But the love of money, as Paul said to Timothy, that's the root of all the evil. When the desire of your heart is to accumulate more and more, as the Bible commentator Warren Wiersbe, I challenge you to say his name three times really fast to yourself quietly. Go ahead, Warren Wiersbe, Warren Wiersbe. Anyway, he said this, Thou shalt not covet is the last of the Ten Commandments, but it is by far the most dangerous. Covetousness will make a person break 
all the other nine commandments together. All the other ones will be broken because of covetousness. You want to serve something? Put something ahead of God? It'll be something you covet, a desire of your heart. Someone other than your spouse? The need to get away with a lie? Murder? All these things start with a desire of the heart that is not appropriate. So what's the answer? What's the answer to this, this idea, this, this concept? How can we avoid defining our life by possessions? Well, Paul talked to this young preacher, Timothy. We've already alluded to something he said to him. And in that same chapter, he goes on to explain how Timothy should approach it when he's preaching to people and, and how he's living his own life. He says in, in 1 Timothy 6, 17, teach those who are rich, rich, <laughs> rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. And I might add a parenthetical statement there, good for someone other than themselves. Because it turns out just doing for yourself isn't necessarily good. It says they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that may, they may experience true life. As Jesus said, wherever their treasure is, there your desires of the heart will be. If they're in heaven, that's where the desires of your heart will be. So our spiritual contrast on this is very simple. Paul is telling Timothy, teach people to be humble about what they have. No matter how hard they've worked for it, They've gotten it because of the grace of God. And so, secondly, recognize God as generous. He's generous to you. And you should reflect that. Third, use things to do good and to show generosity. You should be marked by your generosity with others. And I'm not just talking about your finances. I'm talking about everything of your being. You should be recognized as a generous person. And, and, and last, always be ready to share. We teach our kids that, right? Why shouldn't we be living that as adults? Here's our second warning today. Don't demonstrate your greed by exploitation. Now, here's a good rule of thumb. Don't dis demonstrate greed at any time. But please don't demonstrate this greed by exploiting others, other people, other situation, other things. James says in, in 5 verse 4, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, they're crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts, literally the Lord of heaven's armies. So the way you're treating people has rallied the Lord of the heavenly armies. That doesn't sound like a good thing to get involved with. Throughout history, and not only in James' day, men of wealth have often been guilty of holding back wages of laborers who work for them. This does not mean they didn't pay them, but rather they fraudulently paid them less than it was right. And, and, and I understand something. I understand that you go to most Americans, you go to a lot of people and say, hey, listen, do you think you get paid enough for what you do? Most often the answer is going to be no. No, I'm, I'm worth a whole lot more. It doesn't matter. If you're making minimum wage, someone says, do you think you should be paid more? Yeah, I think I should. You go to a, a sports athlete who's making $30 million a year. Should you be paid more? You say, yeah, of course. I've got to put food on the table for my family. I'm thinking, what are you people eating? It doesn't seem to matter. Wherever we're at, we, we seem to think we're, we're worth more. But this is a realistic case where these landowners, these, these bosses... They were exploiting these, these workers that they had, paying them less than it was right. And we'll talk about how, how they do this. First, it's, they're doing it from unfair compensation. They're profiting from unfair compensation. James alludes to that. And this is nothing new. It's not like James is breaking new ground and telling them something that they didn't know. Way back in the book of Deuteronomy, in the law of God, uh, God instructed them how they should handle these situations. He says, never... Take advantage of poor and destitute laborers. All right? Notice that first word, never. Okay? Never take advantage of poor and destitute laborers, whether they are fellow Israelites or foreigners living in your towns. Immigrants. That's a whole other conversation, isn't it? We don't have time for it today. 
You must pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and counting on it. If you don't, they might cry out to the Lord against you, and that would be counted against you as sin. You see, what is happening is, in this day and time, they didn't have a lot of banks. They didn't have a, a credit system. And so basically, if a person worked, they went out and worked for a, a boss, and that boss would pay them at the end of the day. In the same way, the boss would be selling things at the same time. And so they would, would have that mutual, okay, I'm going to work today, and at the end of the day, I get paid. And, and you probably remember a parable that Jesus told about workers who worked for part of a day and then a short part of the day, and they all got the same amount. But what's happening here is these landowners are getting to the end of that day, James is saying, and they're not giving them enough. They're, they're using all sorts of creative things to let them know that, well, we can't pay you that much. And this unfair compensation leads to putting them in constant state of debt. And it puts them in a constant place of desperation. You see, these, these laborers are not working to become rich they're working to put food on the table for their families. They're working to eke out a living. And in the name of profits, James is saying, you seek to accumulate wealth by exploiting the desperation of people who need to work. Isaiah touches on this a little bit. People of Israel were uh, very quickly closing in on being overrun by the nations around them. They had been sinning against God for a long time, and now God says, okay, I've had enough of this. But the people are still going through the motions of worship. They're still going through the motions of spiritual discipline. They're giving to God. They're, they're fasting. And listen to what Isaiah says. They're saying to, to God, they said, we have fasted before you. Why aren't you impressed? We've been hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. They sound like 12-year-old kids, don't they? So God responds to them through the prophet Isaiah. He says, I will tell you why. It's because you're fasting to please yourself. You're doing it out of, you know, just trying to impress others or, or, or trying to make yourself feel better. But here's the kicker. He says, even while you fast, you're, you keep oppressing your workers. We're fasting. We're not going to eat. We're, we're showing our allegiance to God, but we're not doing anything for these people that are working for us, these ones that we've been oppressing for all this time. We're not going to eat, but we're not going to give the food that we would have eaten to these workers. How deplorable. God tells them through Isaiah, that's why you're going to be turned over into your enemy's hands because you're taking advantage and exploiting those who need help. Second way they're doing it is they're capitalizing on unjust procedures. These procedures were that in many cases, and we'll get to this here in a moment, but, but people didn't necessarily own their own farms, their own land at the time that James is writing. A famous preacher is known for his long sermons, and he was asked uh, many years ago to give an annual, what they called charity sermon for the community to help with the poor in their town. It was suggested by some of the others uh, in his community that if he preached too long, the community might not respond and give as much as they should have because he preached too long. So the preacher read a text from Proverbs 19, 17. He said, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. He then shared this brief sermon. If you like the terms of this arrangement, then put down your money and sat down. You see, because the truth is, if we are helping the poor and lending to God and he's going to repay us, guess what? The antithesis of that is true as well. If you are oppressing the poor, if you're taking advantage, if you're exploiting the poor, you're taking advantage and you're robbing God. And you're going to answer to him and he will repay you. That's what James is saying to these rich owners. You see, the circumstances pictured by James are very much true to life at this time. First century Palestine, before A.D. 70, 
Uh, it witnessed an increasing concentration of land into the hands of a small group of wealthy landowners. People could not afford because things were becoming so difficult. We don't understand that with gas, you know, going as high as it is and things, everything going higher. But in their case, they had, it was a law of diminishing returns. Rome was not helping as much because Rome was in trouble and they were starting to pull back and the Israelites were suffering. And so many small farmers were turning their land over. They were selling their land to landowners who then they would then, then turn around and work for, becoming sharecroppers without really any hope of ever regaining their land, being free from the landowner's control. They were being abused because of their need. They were being exploited because these guys said, ooh, they got nothing else they can do. They'll work for what I give them. They were being abused because of the circumstances of their life and the place in which they were living. And through, the, through James, we realize that God was saying, I'm not having it. Such greed and exploitation was not going unnoticed or unheard by God and was going to lead to the destruction of those who chose to accumulate this wealth and make that the, the pursuit of their life. Zechariah addresses this in a positive way. He says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, same, same word here, Lord of heaven's army says, judge fairly and show mercy and kindness to one another. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. And do not scheme against each other. The spiritual contrast that he's presenting in Zechariah from God is that we need to judge and treat others fairly. Give to them what's right. Not what is most profitable. Not what you think is the least amount that they'll accept. And I realize maybe we don't have too many landowners here, land barons. But we do all interact with people that have needs. Judge and treat others fairly. Give to them what is right. Not in your eyes, but in the eyes of God. Show compassion for those that you know are in need. Choose to encourage others through the actions of your, of your life. And again, always be ready to be generous without an agenda, without a scheme. Last warning. Don't designate your success by extravagance. Don't measure your success in life by the things that you have or how luxuriously you can live. It's the American way. I got gotcha. you. The bigger the house, the nicer the car, the better the vacation. This is how we measure a successful person in the world in which we live. But that's not what James says. He warns against such uh, 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 methods of, of defining success. He says, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. All of us are grateful for good things we have in life. And we certainly don't want to return to primitive ways. I, I, I do not want to drive a horse and buggy. I do like... Ironically, when we have air conditioning. But we must recognize that there is a point of diminishing returns when it comes to things of life. Tell me what thou dost need, said the Quaker to his neighbor, and I'll tell thee how to get along without it. Jesus said, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. These rich men James addressed were feeding themselves on their riches, yet they were starving to death spiritually. The Greek word here pictures cattle being fattened for the slaughter. So what do we learn from this? That when it comes to self-indulgence, this self-indulgent luxury is a waste. And when we waste, we're being sinful. Dads know that, right? Walk around turning off lights. Telling the kids, you know, hey, finish your lunch, finish your dinner. We shouldn't waste. But, you know, there is a great difference between enjoying what God has given us and living extravagantly with our self-indulgence, living on what we have perhaps withheld from others. 
living on something that we've been given as a gift or an inheritance and watched and made it seem as though that's a measure of our success. Jesus told another parable, one that's I'm sure familiar to a lot of you as well from Luke chapter 15. He says a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want uh, my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the son packed all of his belongings and he moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. Living extravagantly. Trying to show everybody how successful he was and how much of a big shot he was. When he comes to his senses in that parable of the prodigal son, we find that he considers when he's going back to his father to say this, this phrase... Because he understood that he had wasted everything that his father had given him because he wanted to live a life of self-indulgence. He says, I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven, against God. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Wastefulness in that measure is sin. But even if what we have has been earned lawfully, even if it's been earned within the will of God, we still must not waste it on selfish living. There are too many needs in this world for us to, to take and, and define our success, to measure our success by the extravagant way we can live. Luke chapter 16. A very poignant story. Very sobering. Jesus says there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived every day in luxury. Let me stop there for a second. This is what we know about him. He was rich. He wore the best that could be offered at that time. And his whole life was defined by luxury. It doesn't say whether he earned his money on his own. Doesn't say whether he got it as an inheritance. His family had been wealthy for a long time. It just says how he lived. And then the contrast to that. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. The irony here is that Jesus shares this story and shares this contrast in a very poignant way. A certain rich man and a poor man. A man who wore was clothed in purple and fine linen and a man who was covered with sores. That was his outfit. And a man who lived each day in luxury. And what do we find out about Lazarus? He lay there longing for the scraps from the rich man's table and the dogs would come and lick his open sores. What we know about Lazarus is what he wore. the struggles and physical pain of life. And it says there that he longed for the scraps from the rich man's table. It doesn't say the rich man even gave him the scraps. But he longed to go through the rich man's garbage and say, is there anything here I can eat? Where this man lived splendidly, lived each day in luxury. But the contrast is not the only point that Jesus is trying to make through this story. We're not going to go on and read the rest of this story. I encourage you to do that if you are unfamiliar with this story from Luke chapter 16. But the real biting truth was that this man lived in this way right outside the gate of the rich man. You think the rich man ever called and asked the police to make sure, you know, their authorities, can you get this guy off my gate? I've got friends coming over and, and the guy's sitting there, he's got sores and there's dogs licking him. Could, could, you, could you just get rid of him? The biting truth is that the opportunity to help was there. It was simply ignored. Because of self-indulgence and greed. Self-indulgent luxury has a way of ruining character. If you match character with wealth, you can produce very much. But if you match self-indulgence with wealth, the result is sin. And this self-indulgence, the lapse of moral character, often leads to a sense of invulnerability. 
we get to that point where we think we've gotten to a place in life where some of these things don't touch us, a feeling that we're above consequences and convictions that others might face, a rationalization of what is we know to be wrong, in God's eyes, we still do. Most of us know the story of David and Bathsheba. David was walking around on the roof of his palace one day. David had, every, had everything you could imagine. And he looked down and sees this woman bathing and wants her for himself. So he has her brought, brought to the palace and he has sex with her. She becomes pregnant. He brings her husband Uriah back from battle. Tries to get Uriah to spend the night with his wife. But Uriah is committed to the to his army, to his task, and won't do that. So David has the commander of his armies pull back everyone except for Uriah when the battle becomes most vicious and Uriah is killed. It's convenient for us to look at that and say, God had nothing to do. God, God wouldn't do anything with David. But what we actually see is probably a period of about 12 months passes. People in the palace, some of them probably knew. There were whispers, but nobody confronted him until God sent Nathan. And as soon as Nathan confronted him, you're the man, David. You're the one that's done this. David was willing to confess his sin. Didn't remove the consequences of that sin, and there's, there's a lot of them. But in that moment... I assume there might have been a relief for David that it was finally out there. He'd exploited so many people in that situation. He had tried to live above everyone else, tried to rationalize what he had done because no one said anything. Listen to what it says. We may have thought he was getting off easy, but listen to what he says in Psalm 32 about this. He says, before I confessed my sins, my bones felt limp. I groaned all day long. Night and day, your hand weighed heavily on me. And my strength was gone as in the summer heat. He was being torn up inside. Now, I, I, I'll tell you the truth. That didn't lead him to repent. It was only when he was confronted that he did that. And there's a whole other message there for us we don't have time for today. But listen to what it says in the next verse of Psalm 32. So I confessed my sins and I told them all to you. I said, I'll tell the Lord each one of my sins. Then you forgave me and took away my guilt. We can't try to measure our success in this life. Our success by the things that we have and the, the way that we live. I mean, it's, it's fun. It's fun going on a vacation, isn't it, when it's one of those all-inclusive ones? I mean, Megan and I, when we got married, we went on a cruise. Do you know that on cruises, they'll let you have ice cream anytime you want, every moment of the day? We went and did that, and it, it was great. But for some, it was, this is how we always want to live. This is the way we want to live our lives each and every day. And I understand the extravagance. I understand the luxury and the comfort of it all. But what we're looking at is when we live that way, we're like that rich man looking out and seeing all the needs and the opportunities to help others. And we're going, nah, just get him off my, get him off my front porch. Maybe we're not rich landowners. Maybe we're not the wealthy of this world. But we have things that we can share with others. And when we don't, we're no better. So what's the spiritual contrast? How do we avoid measuring our success by extravagance? I want to look at the New Testament church in their infancy when they first gave their lives to Jesus Christ after that day of Pentecost. And they began to build a sense of community, helping out those in need and sharing with one another. It says in Acts chapter 2, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. 
They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And again, give me a little leeway here. They weren't just being saved spiritually. Many of them were being saved from their depression and loneliness and hurt and pain and exploitation by others by coming together and sharing a part of a community. The spiritual contrast is first admit that you've made sinful choices when it comes to others. Second, be devoted to the things of God. Be unselfish with what you have. Be sacrificial to those who need help. Build a legacy of joy and generosity. Let the other stuff take care of itself. I'm going to ask Juan to come up at this time. And as we close today, you may note that we, we don't have the standard um, next step that Frank shares with us usually. I hope that we can use those spiritual contrasts as a group of next steps that we can take. Because just like I talked with Robbie last week and said, what are the five most important things in your life? And it's something that you need to regularly inventory to make sure they're in line with God's will. Are you focused on the things that God has done and is doing in your life? So I think it's important for us to go through these spiritual contrasts and, and take a spiritual inventory. Am I living like this? Or is there a place that I'm holding on to way too tightly? Because God is worthy of that. And when we help the poor, we're extending grace and mercy not only to him but to God. And God will repay it, he says. Let's sing this song together. probably not Ishmael. Not too many people call that. And your mother's name is probably not Hagar. But you've probably spent time in a wilderness of sorts. You have been rejected. You've probably experienced times when you've been, trade, been betrayed by those who trusted. You took the scraps of bread and water with you alone and those scraps ran out and the water ran out. And you were ready to give up and maybe even gave up because you had nothing left. And maybe when you join the community of Christ, you don't remember dying to yourself. But you have found over time that you really need to push certain ideas, practices, or people away from you. Because you realize they weren't what God had in mind for you. You knew that to make space for the miraculous life of the Spirit, you had to clean house. You had to cut some ties. Maybe that's something you've gone through. Again, you probably haven't been called the prince of demons. I hope not. But someone has probably insulted you because of the living, breathing commitment that you've made to follow Christ. Maybe it's been subtle. Maybe it was a barber, a joke. 
about how you spend too much time up here. Or, oh, well, you're not available on Sunday mornings. We know that. Maybe it was even someone in your family. You love them deeply and immensely, and that love has never faded, but the pain is as great as the love because they have not accepted Christ as you did. When you are rejected, I want you to know that God hears you and gives you what you need. When you submit to Christ and die to sin, God is present with an endless fountain of life. When you are insulted, the Holy Spirit is within you. God is trying, always working to draw you closer. He allows and uses these hard and sometimes very hard things to pull you to Him so that He can hold you and heal you. He doesn't ask for you to hate those who you have loved. He asks you to love Him more. And He fills you to empower you to do just that. One of the ways He fills you is this invitation to his table each week. He offers himself, body and blood for you. We the empty, the betrayed, the broken and isolated and alone, we're invited to his table together, which is set for us wherever we might be. He draws each of us to himself in love and in so doing, he draws us together in this time. For this is what the Lord himself said and I pass it on to you just as I received. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, the cup is the new covenant between God and you. Sealed by the shedding of my blood, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until Jesus comes again. And that's why we share together each week. Coming together as a community to share in this memorial bread and cup that remind us once again of the body that was broken and the blood that was shed so that we might receive forgiveness through His grace. Let's pray. God, I just thank You this day for so great an offering, so great a blessing. We do, as we sang a moment ago, we worship your holy name because it's only through your holiness that we can gain a righteousness, that we can put on Jesus Christ when we're baptized so that we might stand before you free of sin, unblemished, not because how we have lived, but because how he died on a cross for our sins. And so we remember that gift today. And we praise you in his wonderful name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I love this opportunity that we have every time a, a, a month has a fifth Sunday that we get the opportunity to share with a ministry that we have worked with or that we know, uh, families that have been affected by this, uh, preachers that have been given scholarships to, to study and to learn the craft of preaching. And I'm glad we have this opportunity today to share together in an offering for the Dream Center, an organization uh, across town that does so much good work. Um, I know Sherry and Laverne uh, volunteer there on a regular basis. I know Frank has worked with them and I've worked with them at different times and, and uh, just think the world of the work that they're doing. And they're always trying to raise funds so that they might do some things like helping those who you know, are homeless uh, in need of getting a, a, a high school degree uh, help for their families, food, clothing. And they, they serve in this, this ministry with a great heart, just as is one we enjoy sharing in as well. So today as you give, please understand that every, uh, every bit of our offering that we started on Monday, uh, we've gotten some came in uh, online as well. Every bit of it will be going to the Dream Center to help the work that they're doing here. God has been working to create and redeem from the very beginning, folks. And he does it through all sorts of different ways. This vibrant, creative, exciting work will continue until all of his purposes are accomplished. But he doesn't leave us on the outside of the work. He doesn't leave us just sitting there. He invites us to join in. And so maybe you have money today that you plan to give to the work that he's going to do through the Dream Center as we focus on this mission this emphasis this Sunday. But never forget this truth, because this is the point I want to drive home, that we can't just say, well, every fifth Sunday we're going to collect an offering and give it to somebody. We need to rekindle our own hearts for ministry within this church. These monetary gifts and sacrifices cannot be a substitution for the participation in His work and ministry in the world. It's only a part of what our commitment should be to Christ. That's what He really wants from us. Not just an offering on Sunday. Not just a reminder of, of a, an organization that's doing good works on a fifth Sunday. He wants every part of us. So if your current situation today prevents you from giving money to help and support the Dream Center, that's a choice and or a circumstance known only to you and God. We're not going to be uh, questioning you on the way out. Did you give something or not? We won't do that. We trust that God will provide what this ministry needs to continue their wonderful ministry in the community and in many cases through work and ministry and generosity that groups like us can show as well. Either way, I encourage you to start yourself today when considering what you might offer and present to him beyond an offering here. Give yourself to God listening to his guidance like those trust falls that we used to do as kids. Leaving all that you are for his strength and provision and joy and love. He will let you know once he wants you to give. He wants you to give all of you. And when we do that, remember, when we help the poor, we are lending to God and God will repay it. Let's pray. And the guys will come around after that. God, I just thank you right now for the generosity that I know will be seen in this church family, the, the gifts that will be given. And now, Lord, I just pray for the Dream Center. Pray for the work that they're doing, Lord. Help them to take whatever funds are donated here or in other places and maximize those. In fact, I'm going to just say this, Lord. I know the truth. Lord, you maximize those offerings. You return them to them a hundredfold. You, you show them ideas for ways that that can be used effectively to, to impact and influence the lives of people all over this community. And Lord, as we have opportunity, let us do the same. And I pray for each individual that today, Lord. Pray that you would open their eyes to those opportunities, the Lazaruses that are sitting on the gates of their homes, those that are in need that they've maybe passed by at other times and said, what can I do? What can I do for you, Lord, by helping someone who's in need? I thank you and I praise you once again in the name of Jesus. Amen.